everyone and welcome to our Vethi week number two for apologetics. It's Kyle. I hope you uh, had a great week. Uh, definitely uh, love seeing all of your comments and uh, your assignments and uh, everything coming in and it's just um, amazing what's going on. Hope you had a great uh, Easter and Resurrection Sunday and weekend with your family and your churches and all the productions that were taking place. I know this is kind of a very uh, uh, busy and, and, and difficult time to be able to start a class, but I appreciate all the work that everybody's been putting in uh, and uh, just keep going at it. A um, couple of announcements as we get as we uh, get ready to get started. You'll, uh, as you may have seen or read in the announcement that uh, I sent out, uh, some changes just with the structure of the class. We uh, kind of changed how you access things. Uh, we uh, went and uh, moved and actually made modules for us. So instead of accessing discussions and assignments and all those things separately, we just put it all into the module. So uh, you'll simply, from now on, you'll go to the module section. You'll be able to see everything you need for the week. You'll be able to see uh, these uh, lecture videos. You'll be able to access the assignments. You'll be able to access um, our discussions. Uh, and uh, anything else that we have for that week, you'll be able to go through it. So the quizzes that we're going to have, they'll be posted all right there in that module section. So we have that. Also, uh, I'm going to have it by next week, but uh, uh, maybe something this week. Um, be looking forward to um, see uh, another couple of uh, items for us to look at uh, in combination with our textbook. Also, uh, maybe give us uh, a couple of articles or maybe a couple of videos about apologetics uh, that kind of go along with what we're talking about uh, for us to look at and, and be able to comment on. So be looking for a couple of other things that we're going to add, uh, go ahead and add to the, um, to the program and uh, with, our, with our assignments uh, here. Probably next week for sure, I may get something in this week um, for us. Uh, just to uh, help us expand and, and go a little bit beyond our textbook and uh, maybe have even a more modern look at things. So those announcements and uh, get ready to look at here. Uh, week number two, we have chapters three and four. And uh, we kind of start getting into a little bit more of the meat of what we have going on here. And uh, chapter three uh, is entitled, Is Christ God? So asking the question, is Christ God? And really... Um, kind of beginning to, you know, really ponder that question for ourselves uh, with our life and existence and uh, what, God is, uh, what God has done uh, in our lives and who He is for us. So when we look at chapter 3, some of the things that we see uh, there in there is uh, that God, uh, we know that Christ is God because He has revealed Himself to us. Uh, he has made Himself real to us. Kind of talked about it a little bit last week, how we know who God is in our life because we have personally experienced it. We know uh, that He is real because we have felt it in our lives. We've seen a change. We've been impacted uh, on, a, on, a, on a personal and individual level. That's how we know Christ is God. Uh, his birth split time in two. No other event in history has uh, been able to split eternity in time the way that Christ's birth did. Uh, it split, you know, uh, B.C. and A.D. And no other event uh, like in history has been able to do that. So if Christ is not God, if Christ is not who he claims that he says he is, how could his birth be able to split time and do something that no, nothing else has ever done and no other event has, has ever uh, had if Christ was not God and Christ was not real? Uh, so, you know, one great thing that we see there. Um, also, we see that Jesus, you know, just as Jesus said in the Bible, and, you know, kind of the book kind of turns the question to us is, who do you say I am? Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? They, disciples would say, well, people say that you're this and people say that you're that. But Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? And we kind of get that question turned to us. You know, who do you say that I am? If we're going to be able to be strong defenders of our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ, we need to know who God is in our lives and what he uh, has done for us and, and the uh, testimony uh, that we have to be able to share with others. We need to be able to be able to share what God has done in our lives and the type of uh, character that he has made himself uh, to be in us. You know, each of us have experienced God in a very unique and individual way, just like God has a plan and purpose that's unique for us, a unique calling for us. 
you know, we get to experience God in unique ways. And we, uh, he has a unique character with us because no one else experiences Christ the way we experience him. Other people may be similar, but no one has that same unique experience with Christ that we do. So who do you say Christ is in your life? We also see here in this chapter four claims uh, that we face about Christ. And really, if you take any argument or anybody that wants to challenge our Christian faith, it comes down to one of these four things. Number one uh, is that Christ is a liar. That he, When he uh, walked the earth and, and performed his miracles and claimed to be God, that he is nothing but a liar. And we think of some, you know, some of the things after that when people say that oh he was just a great moral leader and, and and that well if he was a liar then he could not be a great moral leader he couldn't uh be the other things that people say he is if he isn't god so christ is god number one be, uh number one challenge that we see is they say that he is a liar and there's evidence and proof that he's not it just doesn't make sense number two it says that he is a lunatic that he um you know was was pretending and had uh you know mental issues and and his claims didn't make sense you know definitely i know you know like the, the book tells us somebody walking around today claiming that they're god we're gonna think that that person uh has issues and uh is at the very least lying um if not um deranged and and you know uh just having some common sense problems but there's evidence that christ actually is God because when he says that there is nothing to prove that he had issues or uh, has any of the other background that you know someone with those types of problems uh, would have so when it says Christ is a lunatic it's, there's nothing really to back that up also says that Christ is a legend something that was just made up uh, say that you know many of the, the stories and the miracles and things that happened were added by writers in like the third and fourth century and the things that Christ did were just uh, fiction and fairy tale and well we know that's not true because there's evidence of his appearances to people um, the, the documented appearances and, and and the impact and even long lasting to today is as, as we talked about the uh, the evidence and the personal impact in our own lives one of kind of a, a reoccurring theme that we uh, I'm beginning to see for us with the book is uh, a lot of it comes down to that we have personally been impacted. How we know God is real? How do we know our faith is real? How do we know, you know, what we believe is real is because we have experienced it ourselves. Uh, I, th you know, if I really had to boil down apologetics in my testimony and the question, why do you believe in God? Is because I know He's real because I've experienced it myself. The fourth thing that we see uh, here when we talk about claims of Christ is that he's the truth. That everything he says he was, he is. And everything that he, uh, that he did was 100% and is genuine. And that's what we believe as Christians. We believe him and his word. It's written in his word, the, the stories, his, his life, his death, his resurrection. I mean, we just celebrated uh, Easter, his resurrection uh, and death on the cross. And you know what? That is the truth, and that's what is real, and that's what, you know, we uh, live and believe and, and face as, as Christians on a daily basis. We also see here and, and talk about, I like how the uh, chapter kind of summarizes uh, by telling us that the evidence that supporting Christ is God is overwhelming. There is so much more evidence pointing to the fact and pointing to the truth and, and showing us that Christ is God than evidence that he's not God. Um, all of the appearances, the miracles, the written stories and testimonies and accounting, uh, as well as it, you know what we have and happens in our daily lives today, gives us that proof that Christ is God. Now, chapter four takes us uh, into one of the um, one of the big questions I, I think of of non-believers and people that want to challenge our faith. And that question is, did Christ raise from the dead? Uh, you know, it's it's definitely a question that uh, I think has, has crossed most people's minds at any one time hearing the story of Jesus or even becoming a believer and really, you know, trying to understand what it's all about. And when we talk about did Christ raise from the dead, a uh, key thing we see right at the beginning of the chapter says that uh, we have five pieces of data that support this. Uh, number one being the Christian church. 
If Christ didn't raise from the dead, if this wasn't true, how could we have a world, such a worldwide organization that is so well organized with the same story and the, and and uh, just as structured as the church, as the Christian church is, uh, you know the story is consistent, uh, the and everything that's uh, taking place uh, within the Christian church and our beliefs and our structure, it's all consistent and it's all uh, going throughout the world. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, if this wasn't real, it wouldn't be as well structured. We also uh, have the evidence or uh, data from the Christian day and the idea of Sunday being the day of worship and Sunday being the day that we that we gather for worship and for rest and the whole structure of that. And thinking back again to chapter 3, how could we have, uh, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, if it wasn't real, how could he split time and, and, and change the way that uh, the world, that, that people all around the world, uh, Christian or non-Christian, look at and view time? We have the empty tomb. Evidence of the empty tomb and and the stories and the do, and you know documentation of how it was guarded and the, know that he was placed in there and and uh, everything around that and the, but yet on Easter Sunday morning the tomb was empty. And then uh, lastly, and this one the the one that I think is one of the one of the funniest is the swoon theory that Christ didn't die; he just fainted. Or he was really sick, but he recovered. He didn't actually die. He was just kind of passed out for a while. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, thinking the, the, the stories and the, and the documentation, again, of how graphic uh, of his death was. And what his death uh, was, was, was like in the excruciating pain. And uh, even stories of, of others that were... That were uh, crucified and hung on the cross, the two thieves and others throughout that time and the way that that the way that his death was and what it is and how it processed. I, I don't think there's any doubt um, in, in in my mind. There was no doubt for me that Christ did die and he did raise from the dead. Uh, you know, the scientific evidence, we want to get into science and scientific evidence uh, should point, you know, points to the no one can go through that. Uh, no one can experience that and, and should be able to live. So the swoon theory, I think one of the funniest ones that we see. Uh, we have all these evidence and we know that Christ raised from the dead. There's documented appearances of, of Christ raising from the dead and many of them are laid out there in the chapter for us. Um, not just uh, on Easter or right after, his, right after his death, but his appearance to many people uh, after he rose from the dead. Uh, there's evidence there that supports the fact that he did raise. Also, we have contemporary proof. Why did Christ raise from the dead? Because he's alive and active in us today. He's uh, impacting our lives and he is touching our lives and he is uh, working in us on a daily basis. If he was, if he was dead, like uh, gods and other religions like Buddha and Muhammad and you know he wouldn't be alive and working in us uh, daily he wouldn't still be changing and saving lives the way that he is uh, you know it would be a it would be something that we talk about uh, from a very historical standpoint and what he did was good uh, but no God is good God is doing great things in us and he is changing and touching and moving in our lives on a daily basis and uh, that's just a little preview of what we have to look forward to this week, chapters 3 and 4, uh, what we have going on. Uh, again, take a look at the chat, uh, get a read through the chapters. Uh, don't forget our, our study question assignment, um, our discussion posts. Um, I love seeing your comments and everything that you've been putting out there now. It's really great to, uh, to see. You know, I think one of the most rewarding things on my, on my side, uh, being an instructor, is to be able to see that you're being very thoughtful and being very um, uh, logical and intentional uh, in what you're doing. So keep up the great work. I uh, appreciate it. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to message me. Um, uh, use uh, the Canvas to send me a message or uh, use my email address that's there on our syllabus. Uh, it's there and available for you. So hope you have a great week. And I hope you have a great time. I'm looking, really looking forward to what God is continuing to do in our class. This is Kyle, and thank you very much.